lights on. <clears throat> All right, is everyone ready to get going on this beautiful Wednesday morning? Oh, gosh, today is my Aunt Jane's birthday, and I was going to, like, have us all sing to her on this since, like, she could hear it, but I'm not going to do that because she doesn't watch these videos anyway. Um, but I, I was actually reading something this morning, and then, like, I'll get into this. Does anybody know why America doesn't use the metric system overall? It actually goes back to, like, 1778. And, like, so I'm interested in a bunch of, like, stupid stuff. Um, whenever Thomas Jefferson was Secretary of State, so either, I, I believe it was under John Adams at the time, like, we were about to adopt the metric system, but he said it was too French. So that's why we didn't do it. So is anybody, is that cool to anybody? No? And then there was actually this, uh, like, um, what it, the Metric Act of 1886, which was written in 1886, which made using the metric system in America legal. So it actually wasn't legal until then, right? Kind of cool with anybody? No? All right, so any of your other professors that use the metric system, just tell them that they're French and then uh, like convert it to American freedom units. So that's, that's what we should do from henceforth. We'll still use the, uh, yeah, bless you, um, metric system in here. So that has nothing to do with anything. Um, okay, uh, today we're going to finish up uh, Exercise genetics, so a couple of really cool things that I think are going to play into the rest of the semester. And then we're going to get into control of like the internal environment. Technically, that lecture is supposed to be today. There's only like 15, 20 slides in that though. So we'll see how far we get through uh, the exercise genetics and that lecture set. Then after that, we're supposed to be starting bioenergetics. So in your textbook, read chapter two and three. That's th those are the two chapters coming up. Um, control of the internal environment and bioenergetics. So read those. And looking at when our test will be, uh, I have scheduled two times for bioenergetics. So next time and the time after that. Uh, so Monday, Wednesday. And then we have exercise metabolism in there. We might not get to exercise metabolism prior to the first test. So I, like, I'll keep you privy to everything that's going on with that, but uh, just kind of letting you know where everything is. Um, the lab next week is going to be on uh, the energy systems used during wind gates. So I wanted to get into some bioenergetic stuff before that, but I'll explain everything that you need to know in order uh, for that lab to work. So. All right, how genetic signaling works. This is gonna be quite a bit of like memorizable stuff that I'm going to ask you on the upcoming exam. So really pay attention to all of this, at least this general structure here. So here, let's just look at this like it's a uh, like muscle cell. So here, that's the uh, cell membrane, the sarcolemma, whatever you wanna call it. Um, sarco meaning muscle, sarcolemma, membrane, there we go. Here, this is the nucleus. So I'm going to want you to know just about everything that's going on here. And there's a bunch of like $5 words, and I'm cool with you just knowing the acronym. So whenever we have a single bout of muscle contraction, say like you do some curls before you go to the bar to get a bit of a pump, this is what is happening. So one bout of muscle contraction, a couple of things happen inside of a cell. This is called a phosphorylation cascade to where one protein gets phosphorylated. That's what that P means. So something I want you to know about uh, like the P or the phosphorylation, we've talked about different charges of proteins and amino acids. Is there, everyone good with that? Right? So like how magnets work and things. So P, the reason the phosphorylate, phosphorylation cascade is so important is because a phosphate group is negatively charged. So if we throw a phosphate group onto a protein, that actually changes the shape and reactivity of that protein. Is everyone good with this? So it's like PO4, negative three. I think it's a negative three charge. It might be a negative two. I haven't looked at it in a little bit. Uh, and if I don't know, you don't have to know. Just that it's negative. So these proteins frequently are enzymes. This, these phosphorylation cascades are undertaken by a class of enzymes called kinases. So write this down, a kinase enzyme, K-I-N-A-S-E, kinase. That's not the last time you're going to hear that. I'm going to talk about that quite a bit in bioenergetics. So kinase enzymes do a phosphorylation cascade. So 
That means a protein gets phosphorylated, then another protein gets phosphorylated. And whenever I'm saying protein, again to remind you, all enzymes are proteins. So just bear that in mind. Then a protein or an enzyme will cross into, right here, the nuclei, the nucleus, myonuclei. Crossing into there. And then it's going to phosphorylate two things that you need to know about. Right here, HAT. H-A-T, that's histone acetyltransferase. That's going to be important here soon. So histone acetyltransferase, that's one of those like $5 word enzymes. Just call it a HAT, H-A-T. Everyone good with that? Good? Cool. So that gets phosphorylated. Another thing that gets phosphorylated is a TF. TF, that stands for transcription factor. Everyone good with this? Hopefully you're writing this down. Or at least listening to the video afterward. Has anyone listened to these videos? Has there been any issues with the audio on them? No? Excellent. Cool. Good. So uh, someone emailed me that there was uh, this morning. Um, so transcription factor. Then what happens from here? Oop. Hat goes to DNA. And what's that doing? It's unlocking a histone. Well, here, here. So the hat goes to a certain part of the DNA, which is called a histone. H-I-S-T-O-N-E. So what histones are, I'm not going to test you on this, but just so that you know. DNA is very susceptible to oxidative damage, so like rusting. So if it's bound up in histone, we don't have access to those genes, but it protects it from oxidative damage. So histone, uh, acetyltransferase, unlocks that particular gene. And then a transcription factor can go to what's called a promoter region. So all of the genes, all of the different proteins, like myosin, actin, anything, they have like a promoter region, and then there's a whole course of the protein. So like numerous amino acids in a chain, right? So the transcription factor is going toward, to a promoter region. Is everyone with me so far? I'm trying to go slow because this is complicated, and I'm expecting you to know all of this. Transcription factor goes to a promoter region. Then that transcription factor is going to bring in an enzyme called RNA pol 2, RNA polymerase 2. There's RNA pol 1 and a couple of other ones, but we're really only concerned with RNA pol 2 because that's the one that mostly does muscular things that I'm interested in. RNA pol 2, then that's whenever transcription begins. Is everyone good with this? Yes, Nick. The RNA pol 2, the transcription factor, brings RNA pol 2 to that promoter region. Everyone with me so far? Good? OK. That's whenever transcription is happening. Here, there's like a five prime end, and like there's going to be a polyadenylated tail, but you don't need to know any of that. Right there, that is just mRNA, messenger RNA. That's what that signifies. Then we splice out certain parts that aren't usable. And then that mRNA leaves the nucleus and goes to the ribosome. So here, it's uh, like the two subunits of the ribosome, the 40S and 60S subunits. You don't need to know that. Just know that the mRNA left the nucleus and is going towards the ribosome. From here, that's where translation is happening. So then, translation happens. We make the amino acids and protein from that mRNA. And now we have a functional protein. Is everyone good with me so far? 
Go back. Okay. Okay. So um, here, mRNA. So the kind of tail end of transcription made in the nucleus. Then that mRNA, messenger RNA, right, gets exported out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm or cytosol, whatever you want to call it, right, just not inside the nucleus anymore. And then it goes towards the ribosome, and the ribosome does translation, does the protein synthesis. Whenever we talk about protein synthesis, that's what we're talking about. So if you ever read that on bodybuilding.com, T Nation, whatever, that's where it is. Cool? That's all we're talking about. And then from that, that protein synthesis, we get the protein. Cool? Everyone good with this? Good? So relatively busy. This is what's going on. Now, this is a highly selective aspect of what's actually happening whenever we like exercise or do whatever. So what's really happening whenever we exercise? So numerous things are getting phosphorylated, bunches of proteins. Really, I wouldn't write any of this down. I just want you to like un understand like how noisy and how busy this whole process is. A bunch of proteins are getting phosphorylated, a bunch of uh, like transcription factors and hats are getting phosphorylated, and we're opening up a bunch of histones, signaling a bunch of genes, and so on and so forth. So a bunch of things are happening. Is everyone good with this? Right? Really, that's more or less the take home from that. And uh, like here, there can be like pgc one alpha, SOD, uh, SOD2 probably, myosin heavy chain, IL-6, all sorts of things. Right, and if you don't know what those are, like I will explain further, right? Oh, and uh, like I put this in there just because I found this GIF and I thought it looked cool. Do y'all see it? like how the tRNA is like going and like it's making a protein right there? So like there's the RNA, the mRNA, and like it's just going and going, right? No? Okay. Gosh. In my office hours, I just watch this go. For like, like nine to noon, Monday, Wednesday, this is what I'm doing. Like, do you see how it's growing? Gosh, it's, I can't believe I get paid for this, right? Okay, moving on, moving on. Okay, so uh, next, some, some things, uh, more or less just memorizable things. The human genome overall, fairly interesting. Somewhere between 20,000 and 25,000 genes overall. Overall, that's all, that's all you have. Like, your person, that's all you, right? So probably 25,000 is like the number that we're going, going to go with. Interesting thing about that. In our body, we make probably over 100,000 different distinct proteins with different functions. Is that crazy to anybody? Right? So... Interestingly, it's not one gene, one protein. Evolution wasn't like that. That's too inefficient. A one-to-one -one doesn't work. So it's really like a one-to-four, basically. So how does this happen? Does anybody have a guess? It doesn't matter if you have a guess. I'm going to tell you. Okay, cool. Next up. So how do we do that? How do we do that? First thing that I want you to know. Alternate splicing. So this is frequently done with something called a spliceosome. All I want you to know is alternate splicing is one way how we can have numerous proteins from a single gene. Now this, I'm going to tell you these things just because I wish I would have known this in undergrad whenever I went to grad school because, well, no one ever told me any of this type of stuff. Overall, inside of a genetic sequence, there's readable parts and non-readable parts. So there's something called an exon, which is essentially readable DNA, meaning it's coding for something. So does everyone see exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, so on and so forth, right? Do we see this? All of these, like, interspersed, like, what is that? Uh, quail's egg blue color, right, in between them. 
right? I thought that was funny. That's called an intron. Sorry, sorry, Sid. Yeah, exon is readable DNA. Tron, I N T R O N. Tron, like the movie. This light blue part, those are introns, frequently called junk DNA, meaning that they're just there, kind of as placeholders. Now, one idea behind it is that it might increase like the like legitimate like structural stability of genes. And a lot of like geneticists have pushed back that it's not junk DNA. It actually has a lot to do with like differential signaling and things. But we're not going to talk about that too much. Really, the thing here is that exons. So we have exon one, two, three, four, five, whatever, whatever, whatever. Whenever we're splitting these together, we can put them in different orders. So whenever like a particular exon, think about that as like an amino acid or a set of amino acids with charges. So we can put them together and it, it's really like Legos almost. Like whenever you have a whole assortment of Legos, you can put them together to like make different things, but they're all like the red Lego, the <coughs> yellow Lego. What I haven't played with Legos in a long time, so I don't really know how that works. But is that analogy working at all? Maybe? No? Okay, well, it made sense to me. So, all right, that's that. So we can put all of those together, alternate splicing. One particular case of this that I want you to be aware of. Has anyone ever heard of IGF-1? Insulin-like growth factor one. So if you're interested in muscle building, IGF-1 is a big deal. So uh, like IGF-1 binds to different muscle cells and it kind of increases protein synthesis. So big I, big G, big F, little dash, one. IGF-1 increases muscle protein synthesis. After you do like, a, like numerous bouts of like resistance training, we actually do some alternate splicing with the magical spliceosome to make something called MGF1, mechano growth factor one. And an interesting thing about this is numerous like bodybuilder strength athletes have figured this stuff out and they're injecting MGF1 and it's pretty cool. So it's uh, now, I'm not sure if it's illegal yet. I shouldn't be recording this. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Um, Alternate splicing, that's one thing that works. And like MGF1 is a little bit more anabolic than IGF1. So there you go. Another thing, alternate promoter sequences. So remember how I said the transcription factor goes to the promoter sequence. There are different, pro well, it's kind of related to the frame shift on myostatin that if we have this long stream, uh, long stream, hard, not strain. Strain's not a word, right, yet. Whenever I'm chancellor, it will be a word. Um, I'm gonna keep all of my stories to myself. All right, um, there's a long strain, whatever, a long set of uh, like exons and things, and we can start at a particular exon or we can start at a different exon. And that can completely change what the protein looks like, depending on where we start. Is it right? Yes. So you can start wherever, and it's just like basically like a different Yeah, 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 pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, like. Really understanding it that way that you can start wherever. I'm cool with y'all thinking that in class here, but there are like particular places where like you can only start in this like one certain promoter or this other promoter region or whatever. But starting wherever, I'm good with that for, for this. Good? Everyone good with this? Good? So alternate splicing, alternate promoter sequences. That's how we get a hundred thousand proteins from twenty-five thousand genes, right? Because humans are magical. All right. Um uh, already talked about the central dogma theory. If you don't know Dana, Renan, protein, then I don't know. Like, you should know that uh, by now. Okay, moving on to one of our papers, a particular thing that I, I don't know, I, I found somewhat interesting from the integrative biology of exercise. I've, I've thought in the past that 
I should just have y'all read this paper and then have like one quiz over it. And if you get 100 on this quiz, then you just get an A in this class. Because if you understand every word of this paper, then I don't know, like there's nothing I'm going to teach you. Um, <clears throat> that's not true. I don't know, like I might teach you how to do a wind gate or something. Um, or a particular exercise test. But this paper has a really cool idea about uh, just kind of integrations of biology overall. So I'm going to read this to you. Exercise provokes widespread changes in numerous cells, tissues, and organs that are caused by or are a response to the increased metabolic activity of contracting skeletal muscle. To meet this challenge, multiple integrated and redundant responses operate to blunt the homeostatic threats generated by the increased energy and oxygen demand. In this muscle-centric view of exercise, the uh, systemic cardiovascular, respiratory, neural, and hormonal responses are viewed as service functions supplying the contracting muscles with fuel and O2 to sustain a given level of activity. So what does this mean? What does this mean? It essentially means, and I'm biased, of course, that exercise and muscles are the most important things on the planet, right? That everything else is effectively servicing those. And this kind of makes sense. Out of all of our different like systems, the muscular system is the one that has essentially the most like latitude in it. So it can have essentially no metabolism to a bunch of metabolism. And all of the other systems are a little bit more constricted than the muscular system. So they're servi like all of these systems, so like the immune system is servicing the um, uh, the muscular system in numerous ways. The integumentary system, your skin, that's servicing uh, the muscle system in numerous ways. Um, and like we'll talk about all of these ways throughout the class. But overall, whenever you go to the doctor, this is why a stress test is so important. Has anyone ever heard of the, like the Pr Bruce Protocol? Right, like in uh, 415, we've done it. Right, in this class, we're going to do it again. But we're going to like change a couple of things. Whenever you do a stress test or the Bruce Protocol, you are testing every system in the body. So we're taking you from homeostasis to as high as you can basically go within the muscular, cardiovascular, and respiratory systems. And yeah, like, I don't know, it's pretty cool. Like, it's, it's kind of why in like health appraisal or uh, like research methods, if y'all are taking that with me, one of the biggest confounding variables about just about anything is how physically fit is this person? Because if someone's physically fit enough, various other variables don't really matter so much, right? So uh, like one classic one that, I, that I've talked about and I will always talk about, if you have a certain aerobic capacity or fitness level, smoking doesn't cause cancer, right? Like if you can run like a five minute mile, smoke up, right? Now, I'm working on it because I want to pick up the habit again. Ugh, gosh. That's, uh, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. All right, moving on. Moving on. Man. Uh, here, this, uh, like, from, from that paper, just looking at a couple of systems that are, uh, like, increased a lot in terms of exercise. So the central nervous system, really we have to maintain most of that. Like if we don't have enough like blood flow to the brain, for example, lights out. That's why, you know, like Brazilian jiu-jitsu and choking people work so well. Like just off that hose and then uh, all of that's good. But there's other things going on in the central nervous system. Um, metabolism goes up, obviously. Uh, whenever we think about metabolism, generally we think about two organs mostly. So the liver being the primary one and also like adipose tissue or fat cells being another one. Uh, skin and tegumentary system, like sweat rates going up, oxygen transport, skeletal muscle turnover, all sorts of cool things with this. Um, I'm not going to test you over any of this too hardcore, but like I would look at this. I, I think it's fairly interesting. Good, like with just just getting up and starting jogging, all of this nonsense is happening, right? Like it's super busy. Um, here is another. Uh, uh, kind of picture from uh, that paper. So there's numerous aspects of control during exercise. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like if we have an increase 
and like muscular activity, that's going to send some type of signal back to the central nervous system to maybe increase heart rate, increase respiration, increase metabolism, do some different neuroendocrine things. Or we could have like some feedback from just whatever is circulating in your bloodstream. Like we all have glucose in our bloodstream right now. If that dips too low or if it goes too high, that can have an effect on the central nervous system and subsequently skeletal muscle and all of these other systems. Uh, PO2, just the pressure of oxygen. PCO2, pressure of carbon dioxide. Just really quick, um, what do we think happens whenever we exercise? So MAP stands for mean arterial pressure. Whenever we start exercising, does that go up or down? Jake's right, up, yes. So mean arterial pressure goes up whenever we're exercising, so we need to control that. Um, like blood glucose, what happens? Does it go up or down? Typically down, typically down. Now, I mean, there, there are some like gluconeogenesis effects, like depending on the type of exercise that we do, but like overall, blood glucose goes down. Uh, PO2, so amount of oxygen in your blood, what happens whenever you start exercising? It goes down, right? So that's part of the reason why we start breathing more, right? So like more transfer into muscles with like the whole myoglobin thing. And like, like we'll talk about that more. CO2, how about that one? Does that go up or down? Up, yes, yes. So I might know those. So whenever we start exercise, MAP goes up, glucose goes down, PO2 goes down, CO2 goes up. I might know that for a pop quiz at some point, okay? Cool, so if I said it, what's up Nick? goes down during exercise. Typically during endurance exercise, it goes down. Um, okay. This next slide, there's a couple of aspects that I want you to understand about this. Whenever we were talking about how genetic signaling works, here, where it says PGC1 alpha, it's like a peroxisome proliferator, coactivator, gamma, something, something, something. It doesn't really matter what it is. Um, but PGC1 alpha, what I want you to understand with that, and this is going to come up here uh, very soon, just think about that with endurance adaptations. So if you're trying to get better at running 5Ks, a mile, marathon, whatever, you want more PGC1 alpha typically. So this figure essentially explains why we have to do numerous bouts of exercise. So, if we look at PGC1 alpha mRNA, that blue, that blue line, after a first bout of exercise, this comes from a study with numerous bouts of exercise. So, like, there's one bout of exercise here, one here, one there, one there, so on and so forth. So, just follow along with me here. Every bout of exercise, say endurance exercise, will increase transcription. So we will get more mRNA of whatever type of adaptation that we're doing. Is everyone good with this? Right? Now, numerous mRNAs are actually not converted into proteins. Like, they go towards the ribosome and they just get destroyed for whatever reason. Is everyone good with this? So if you go out and jog today, are you going to be better at jogging tomorrow? No, adaptation takes time. That's really what like, I'm trying to like, get through to you right here. So here the relationship is numerous times of doing the exercise, increasing the mRNA, it takes a bit until this protein, so the translation or protein synthesis level, starts to go up. Do you all see that? Good. After a while of doing the signal, then we actually start getting more proteins. So the transcription to translation isn't 100% efficient. Everyone good with this so far? And then this very last one, CS max activity. That stands for citrate synthase. So if you know anything about the mitochondria, and I'm going to like talk to you about this quite a bit. Um, so uh, does anybody know like the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle, all of that type of stuff? 
So the citric acid cycle, the first enzyme in there is citrate synthase. So if we measure the activity or how much that enzyme is working, we get a rough proxy of how many mitochondria are actually inside of a muscle cell. So that's the end goal. That's what we really want to increase. So the relationship here is we get a fair bit from exercise. Like this is why we have to do numerous bouts of exercise. We get quite a bit of the mRNA, so the transcription level. And after a while, we get some on the translation and the protein level. And then finally, after an even longer period of time, if you see the citrate synthase max activity going up, it takes forever until we actually get more mitochondria inside of a muscle cell. Is everyone good with this? Right? So this is essentially why, right? And I, I'm sure I've said this uh, too much already. That's why I don't go back and listen to these, because it's, I don't know. It hurts me to hear my voice. Um, that's why we have to exercise consistently, right, to get adaptations. Is everyone good with this? Right? So far, so good. All right. Cool. Yes, DJ. Can you remind me what, why PGC1A is significant? That's coming up here in a minute. So, yeah. Uh, like, really, it's, um, it's effectively going to be like a transcription factor for numerous adaptations for endurance training. So, like, I'll show you all that here in a bit. And, in fact, kind of right here. Overall, there's basically two different types of adaptations that can happen. So, how I want you to see this, this, this basically looks like Greek or some gobbledygook up here to you, right? Just see this as like one thing going to another thing, going to another thing, and then just you have to like memorize the letters basically. And there's particular letters that I think are much more important. Overall, we have two classes of adaptation inside of a muscle. So one being muscle growth, and the other being mitochondrial biogenesis or increase in number of mitochondria. So effectively, size and strength on one side, and on the other side, endurance, basically. Everyone good with this? So what is signaling these? Muscle tension and different growth factors signal hypertrophy. So if we look up here, IGF-1, I talked about that a little while ago. You don't really need to know much about that. There's this other thing, that PA, that's phosphatidic acid. If you pay attention to supplements, you can take phosphatidic acid, and it might increase muscle growth just a little bit. I, I know one of the guys that did some of the first things with it. Uh, like it, it seems fairly interesting to me. Um, there's another thing, fac focal adhesion kinase. Essentially, what that is, is a muscle sensing tension on it. Now, none of that you need to know yet. The only parts that you really need to know, for me, memorize this, AKT, mTOR, P70, S6K, and that leads to protein synthesis. Yes, yes. AKT, mTOR, P70S6K, protein synthesis. That is all you have to trigger for your muscles to grow. That's it. And throughout the rest of the semester, I'm going to be talking about different things that trigger this. It's fairly simple. It's amino acids, it's lifting stuff. It's basically what it is. Now, AKT. You can also write down PKB for it. It's called that as well, protein kinase B. If you, uh, if you read uh, like papers out of uh, Great Britain, they frequently call it PKB. Here in America, we call it AKT. Now, technically, AKT doesn't really seem to stand for anything. It's like this serine, theranine, uh, like kinase thing. Uh, so, uh, but I learned it as AKT, so I want you to know that. Um, 
mTOR, that stands for mammal mammalian target of rapamycin. And if anybody's ever heard of like rapamycin, that might be a longevity drug. So uh, like if you give it to people, like they might live longer. So I, that's not really related to this class, but I think it's interesting. So, um, and P70S6K, so on and so forth, right there. So resistance training essentially triggers all that. On the other end, triggering endurance. So hopefully everybody remembers what ATP is. Does everyone know what ATP is? The energy currency of the body, right? So like whenever we're you know, doing muscle contractions, we're not directly using carbohydrates or fat to do any of that. We have to like take the chemical energy in those to put more phosphates on to like an ADP and then like we break those down eventually. Um, we'll talk more about that. We have to trigger something called AMPK, adding monophosphate kinase. I'm going to talk more about that as things go on. Really what triggers that is a ratio of AMP to ATP. So for those of you that like aren't in the know yet, that essentially just means that there's an energy deficit inside of the muscle cell. Like we don't have a bunch of energy in there. And interestingly, endurance training triggers this, and so does fasting. Like you don't eat for a couple of days, you trigger AMPK a lot. So here, that's how that's triggered. We have to trigger AMPK. There's a bunch of different subunits. I'm not going to talk about those. Um, down from AMPK, the next thing I want you to know, DJ, PGC1-alpha. This is where that works in, PGC1-alpha. Once we trigger PGC1-alpha, then we can move on to get mitochondrial biogenesis. And I'm going to show you more with that here in a bit. And, uh, well, like, here, I'll, I'll talk about more soon. So STARS, if you're interested in, like, what that is, it's the uh, striated muscle activator of row signaling. I don't know. That's kind of cool. Right? Anybody? I'm not going to test you on that. I just thought the acronym for STARS being that was fun. So. Yes, Anna. Yes. Well, so, um, right, it's not. But on a cellular level, it's fairly close. Like, what fasting does and what endurance training does is it reduces the amount of ATP within a cell, right? So fasting does it by like not giving you like more coal into the fire and the other one does it like running or whatever it does it by like burning the coal up a little bit faster. So it's really just like adding versus subtracting and like what we're doing more of. So if you stop adding and you're only subtracting, then we're going to trigger that a little bit. Now, like I will completely agree with you, the effect is not nearly as robust as like endurance training, um, but it's uh, the effect is still there. So it's, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's kind of cool. Is that interesting to anybody? That might be part of the reason why some people do fasted cardio. So it, uh, like, it might work a little bit for like fatty acid oxidation. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, next thing, exercise memetics. I just wanted to talk about this momentarily to let you know where a lot of research has been going. And uh, the Frank Booth guy that we were talking about before, this has been some stuff that he's been super interested in. So we all know most people don't exercise. So what if you could just take a pill and it would do all the positive cellular stuff for you? That's what this is. So like an exercise mimetic, meaning mimic, you know, so like it mimics exercise. Uh, like in, in the thing, it's called like a poly pill, but there's two different like substances that I want you to be somewhat aware of uh, that people are actually taking now. Um, something called metformin. Metformin, M-E-T-F-O-R, wait, M-I-N, okay, good. Metformin. Has anyone ever heard of this drug before? Mindy, you have. What's in relation to? Uh, diabetes. Yes, yes. So... Something really cool with metformin, what it does, it is an AMPK agonist, meaning it stimulates that. So 
AMPK agonist, that does cool stuff with mitochondrial biogenesis, but it also increases glucose uptake into muscle cells. So that's why diabetics are taking metformin. Cool? Cool? It seems like there is a relationship with, uh, like, metformin and longevity. Some, uh, some like, Silicon Valley people who are, like, intro Does anybody know, like, Ray Kurzweil is or, like, Aubrey de Grey? They're, they're, like, different crazy people that want to live to be, like, 200 years old or 300 or 4,000 years old, something like that. There's a, what is it? There's a documentary on Netflix. Is it called, like, it's not Bicentennial, man. That's Robin Williams. Um, I don't know, like, Future Man. I, I don't know what it is. Ray Kurzweil. I, I don't know how to spell his last name. Um, but these are people that want to, like, live forever, essentially. And they're taking metformin in order to do that. Because there's something to do with, like, how long a cell lives. And if you stimulate AMPK, that actually turns off mTOR. And you might be able to live forever. Obviously not. But that's the idea behind it. Right? No. 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 That's, uh, crap, what's that guy's name? Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. Yeah. No, like, he's not trying to live forever. He's trying to make his brain really good. Which, just take caffeine to do that. Right? More caffeine in this class. Not enough involvement from you people. Um, all right. No, like, it's okay. Like, I like hearing myself talk. But MPK metformin's doing that. So that's a drug that's used quite frequently that I want you to know about. Another thing uh, that, like, you might want to know. ICAR. ICAR. This is another AMPK agonist. If you ever, like, if you go to grad school and you work in, like, a lab or something like that, ICAR is frequently used to put into cell culture models in order to get an endurance adaptation of, like, a muscle cell. So it simulates AMPK just about the same. It's crazy expensive, but, you know. It's pretty cool. All right. Exercise memetics. We talked about metformin, ICAR, cool, interesting stuff. Um, now, training for endurance and strength. So those are kind of the two ways how to do it. So lifting weights for AKT, mTOR, so on there, and like running or fasting for PGC1 alpha, or AMPK, PGC1 alpha, mitobio there. Something I wanted to talk about that y'all don't have yet um, is, uh, well, here, what this says, uh, concurrent training leads to less adaptation when trained together. So if you're training endurance and strength, there is what's called an interference effect. I'm going to show you that here momentarily. Resistance exercise leads to increase in muscle mass. Endurance leads to all of these myriad of things, capillary density, uh, mitobio, fatty acid oxidation, all of that type of stuff. I wanted to throw in this study that I wanted to, uh, well, I know the guy who did this study. His name is Jeffrey Gurgley. He did it from Stephen F. Austin State University in 2009. So that's where I did my undergrad and master's. He's a pretty cool guy. Jeff Gurgley. What he was interested in, he had people like lifting weights, lifting weights. And he had like two other groups lift weights and do a particular type of endurance exercise. So one type of exercise was cycle ergometer, so like riding a bike. The other one was running on a treadmill. So I want you to understand here that there was the most strength adaptation with resistance training only. So this percent change, it's how much they increased on like a deadlift or something. I forget what he did exactly. For resistance plus cycle ergometer, there was less, but there was more than running on a treadmill. So here is an application idea for us. If we have an individual who's somewhat of a strength athlete, <coughs> what type of cardio should they do if they should do cardio at all? I basically just told you. So I mean, like, thank you. Thank you. Cool. Great. Yes. Yes. Write that down. That, that's going to show up on test. Excellent. Now y'all are writing this down. You don't want to know how to do these things, right? Okay, whatever. What, what, uh, what you're saying pretty much cycle ergometer is in this study more effective. Is that all you're saying? Uh, no, it is better at preserving strength adaptation. 
Now, there's numerous reasons for this. There's no like eccentric phase of a cyclergometer, so there's not much muscle damage. Um, like running on a treadmill, there's more muscle damage. It's more weight bearing. Now, problems here. Problems here. If we're trying to burn a certain amount of calories and lose a certain amount of fat, what's better, cyclergometer or treadmill? Treadmill, definitely. So there's kind of a trade-off there. Like whenever you're running on a treadmill, you're moving your whole body mass through space-time, right? Now, on a cycle ergometer, you're really only moving the weight that's on there. And like the highest weight that someone moved yesterday with the uh, like 10 sets of uh, like 10 whatever was 10 kilograms. So that's 22 pounds. And for the person who did it, it was rough, right? 22 pounds moving that. But if you move your whole body, that's at least 100, right? Right, so we can burn a lot more calories moving our body through space and time. Cool? So I'm sorry that I'm going so slow with this lecture, but I think it's fairly interesting. Um, so next time, we'll get into like these two main players I'm going to talk about, AKT and AMPK, more. It's going to be interesting stuff. All right, have a good weekend.